In the annals of Chinese wisdom, there is a saying, every step makes a footprint. The footprints of the Chinese in Australia are everywhere. They are a successful part of the great Australian story of assimilation. Yet the road to success was often rocky and dangerous. Records show the earliest known Chinese immigrant to arrive in Sydney is reported to have been Cantonese-born Mei Sire Ying, who arrived as a free settler to the colony in New South Wales in 1818. After a decade later, in 1829, Mei Sire Ying, or John Shying as he became known, was granted the licence for the Golden Lion public house at Parramatta and, in November 1836, showing he was a man of considerable means, he purchased a newly built residence on Church Street. More often than not, he was simply referred to as the Chinaman. An article in the Sydney Gazette in 1837 referring to John Shying mentioned the Chinaman. We have been assured by the most respectable quarters stands very high in the estimation of the Parramatta public. John Shying's descendants became successful cabinet makers and undertakers in George Street, Sydney. J and G Shying were instrumental in the establishment of the Undertakers Society of Sydney in 1885. The Chinese were generally seen as a curiosity. They looked different, wore strange oriental clothing, had pigtails and spoke in a sing-song indecipherable language. They became known as Celestials because the Chinese Emperor was known as the Son of Heaven. More often, the Chinese were colloquially called John. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the term first emerged with British sailors who, uninterested in learning how to pronounce the names of the Chinese stewards, firemen and sailors who worked as part of their crews, came up with the generic nickname of John. Australians had a similar problem with the language, and the name struck. It was not considered a racist slur. In the 1840s, as Australia's population grew, the tide started to turn against the Chinese, who were seen as cheap labour and a threat to Australian society. With the discovery of gold in 1851, Australia opened up to the world. In the space of two gold-crazed decades, our population grew by well over a million. Hopeful miners came from all over the world, including China. Many Chinese came directly from the Californian gold rush. The fact that the Chinese were industrious hardly endeared them to their fellow miners. Hostility and harassment was common on the gold fields. Some Chinese, seeing opportunity, opened tea rooms and restaurants to find a new gold. The miners of the goldfields ridiculed the Celestials and often chased them away. In some cases, pigtails were cut off to humiliate them. They sang songs to mock them. What's the use of talking? They won't let the white man live. Cause if there's any work to do to a Chinese bloke, they'll give. Sack them all, you straight dead natives. Take my advice and plan. And turn your skin the right side in and become a Chinaman. Oh, goodbye, Mrs. Much Dupin. of the anger towards the goldfield Chinese was fueled by the frustration of mining camp life and the desperation to find the precious metal. Nothing else mattered. Blaming the Chinese relieved frustration and diverted thoughts of desperation and isolation. As the gold petered out and mining companies were established to dig deeper into the ground, many Chinese gold hunters stayed in the towns and opened businesses, including general stores and restaurants. Generations of Chinese Australian immigrants still operate these businesses. Life in the city was more orderly, although the Chinese were still seen as second class and a threat to labour. Like many migrant groups, the Chinese congregated as a community, and Sydney's first Chinatown, the narrow Essex Street near Circular Quay, was established in the 1850s. It served the Chinese community for the next 50 years before drifting down to the Haymarket and the area surrounding Sydney's Dixon Street. 
Physical attacks were not uncommon. In 1888, the Sydney Morning Herald reported, Chinese attacked. On Thursday night, a series of disgraceful, brutal assaults were committed on the Chinamen in the neighbourhood of Essex Street. Roughs of the very lowest order attacked aged and crippled Chinamen and thrashed them so savagely that nothing but their bare life was left them. During the progress of the assaults, crowds of shrieking larrikins stood around and applauded the villainry. From the 1870s onwards, industrious Chinese market gardeners supplied Sydney's vegetable and fruit needs. There were extensive market gardens at Rushcutters Bay and Botany. Life was not easy. Sydney larrikin gangs took it upon themselves to harass the Chinese by attacking their crops and throwing rocks. Raiding the Chinese gardens was considered a sport by these hooligans. The Chinese rarely retaliated. Racist slurs of chows and chinks were common even in the popular press. Tension often turned to physical anger, with the authorities turning a blind eye, or worse still, siding with the street thugs in court. In the 1890s, feelings about the Chinese were mixed. A writer alluding to the popular dislike of Chinese labour competition summed it up simply, The Chinam is too industrious for his Caucasian brother. There was occasional support, an article in the Illustrated Sydney News in 1880 argued, John Chinaman is not popular among the labouring classes. However, from a long observation of him in this colony, I have come to entertain a very favourable opinion of him. He is sober, industrious and peaceful. And, despite what is said to the contrary, he is quite as honest as his neighbours. There were, of course, some spectacularly successful Chinese stories, and none more so than that of Mei Kuang Tart. Kuang Tart was born in 1850 in the Guangdong province, village of Shandi. As a young boy, he travelled to Australia with his uncle, accompanying Chinese labourers bound for the southern New South Wales New Gold Mountain. In Braidwood, he stayed with the Scottish miner and store owner Thomas Forsyth, from whom he learned a love of all things Scottish. The young Quang Tart was such a quick learner, even his accent was Scottish. By the age of 21, Quang Tart had amassed a small fortune from gold claims and in 1871 he repaid his good fortune by becoming a naturalised British citizen. In 1881 he visited China, established trading relations and returned to open a network of highly successful silk stores and tea shops, the first tea rooms in Sydney. On his return from China, wearing his trademark kilt, he jokingly announced to the newspapers, My foot is on my native eth. My name is now Muk Tart. Kwong Tart's six tea rooms at the Royal Arcade, Haymarket, Moor Park Zoo, George Street, Sydney Arcade and King Street were famous throughout Australia, but it was his elite hall in the Queen Victoria building where his most successful enterprise flourished. With seating for over 600, it became Sydney Society's meeting place. Opened in 1898, the elite housed restaurants, tea rooms, exhibition area and a stage for concerts and ceremonies. Quang Tart was a much-admired Sydney identity highly respected for his business acumen and philanthropy and loved for his kindness and eccentricity. The Daily Telegraph of 1897 observed he was as well known as the governor himself and quite as popular among the classes. His funeral saw thousands of Sydney siders line the streets to pay their respects to this remarkable man. Two hundred men escorted his coffin from his home to the mortuary railway station and onwards to the Chinese section of Rookwood Cemetery. Despite Quang Tart's popularity, anti-Chinese feeling in Australia had been in overdrive since the 1870s and had been fuelled by the continuing struggle for Australians to shape and identify a national identity. In many ways, we saw ourselves as better than English, but we also knew the tyranny of distance. We saw the Chinese as foreign, confusing and not like us. As we moved closer to uniting the colonies and becoming a federation of states, we questioned many aspects of our society. 
popular magazines like The Bulletin, with its banner headline of Australia for the White Man, carried endless editorials and cartoons ridiculing non-whites. Organisations like the Anti-Chinese League organised public demonstrations and stoked the fires of racism. Even children absorbed racist views of the Chinese, and numerous playground skipping and clapping chants, even nursery rhymes, ridiculed the Chinese. Newspapers regularly featured racist stereotypes in their children's sections. How to make a Chinaman certainly wouldn't pass muster today. It is strange that a nation which saw itself as the land of the free, the land of the fair go, should witness the introduction of the White Australia policy in its first federated parliament in 1901. The White Australia policy stood guard on Australia's shores for 72 years and was finally legally dismantled in 1973. Sydney's Paddy's Market at the Haymarket remains the centre of Chinese life in Sydney. Historically, it was here that the suburban market gardeners sold their produce. General and specialist shops were opened and restaurants flourished. Slowly, the bright-coloured Western-style faux Chinese dishes created to appeal to Europeans gave way to more authentic regional Chinese cuisine and the area developed to be recognised as one of the leading Chinatowns of the Western world. Each of the neighbouring streets have, at one time or another, been regarded as Chinatown. It was the invasion of American R&R servicemen in the 1940s that really popularised Sydney's Chinatown restaurants. Food is always a good way to accelerate assimilation. Australia without Asian food is now unthinkable. Times do change. In the 1960s, over a hundred years after so many thousands of Chinese had ventured to Australia in search of gold, Australia started to realise we were geographically closer to Asia than Britain. The Bulletin magazine, once the most outspoken anti-Chinese voice in Australia, cemented the changed Australian view when, in 1961, its new editor, Donald Horne, removed the magazine's racist banner. In 1967, the Bulletin reported, Mr King Fong, who inherited his store in Dixon Street, tells us that his father came from Fiji in 1946 and established his first store in Dixon Street. His children and their children had lived all their lives in Australia and, like most second and third generation Australian Chinese, they have been to school, matriculated and many of them attend university. The younger generation is impossible, said one Chinese businessman. All they want to be is Australian. Xenophobia, a fear of foreigners, expresses itself in many ways and is usually without reason or reckoning. The 2020 novel COVID-19 pandemic originating in China saw increased racism aimed at Australian Chinese, even those whose family footprint had been here since the very earliest days of colonisation. History teaches us to tread carefully and respectfully. Sadly, we are often slow learners. Sydney has much to celebrate in its Chinese heritage. Music